two, one, two. Hey, check this out. I finally painted this half of the studio, so they now match. Anyway, a little explanation for my Dub Would Be Good To Me project. It was a song playing on the radio when I was thinking about it. As I know, sometimes people appreciate being able to understand the thinking behind a piece of work. So this is not a complicated project at all. And I mean, it doesn't need to be. It uses some very simple, I'm going to mess this up, com positional tricks that I thought were worth highlighting because you often see like two different pieces of work on FX hash and for some reason one is more successful and popular than the other and it's not always obvious why this one's just edging it out and it's often just down to the, the understanding and composition behind the two of them. When people start generative art and the random element of it they often apply randomness evenly across everything while people who've studied art or just have a natural aptitude for it tend to shape that random randomness and use traditional well-established rules of composition. This is what I did for my project and again these aren't complicated that's kind of the point behind it but they are intentional and there's three of them. The first is making sure the artwork has a background and a foreground. The background is supposed to be like functional it acts as scaffolding or foundation while the foreground is your point of interest. This project is made up of four layers. It's got two background layers and then two foreground layers. The background layers are made from these scenes here, 24 retro futuristic indoor scenes, and then 24 outdoor landscapes, probably also shown here. I'll stick them all up here. And how these ones came about, I'll, um, I'll cover a little bit later. And this is how the four layers are built up. The first one is an indoor scene, and that's picked from those 24 at random. And then we select a number of triangles to take from one point in the image, and then randomly place it at another point in the image. And sometimes we flip them if we need to. So you might take a, a pointing up triangle, and then place it into the position of a pointing down triangle somewhere else. So here's some examples of that. It already has a nice feel to it, I think. And now we randomly pick the second layer from all of the outdoor landscapes and then gain, take some triangles from that landscape and then place them in random positions on top of the background that we already have. So they look like this and this and a few more examples like this. And that is the foundation of the artwork. And that brings us to our foreground. For that, we're using faces or portraits. The great thing about faces is that our brain loves faces. It can pick out a face from miles away and then even see faces when they're not really there. There's a word for that. I forget it at the moment. So here are the 24 faces that I'm using. This isn't like a cheat code I'm using here, but it kind of is. I want you, the viewer, to see the whole piece and then recognize elements in it, like an eye or a chin or a mouth. And once you've seen one part, then you start looking for the other parts of that image. Then your brain is kind of trying to solve a puzzle, giving that artwork some energy because your brain is working at the image instead of just you know taking it in. And triangles, they're kind of an energetic shape too. Now, a couple more tricks here for the third and fourth layer, which is our foreground. Now, I'm no expert on portraits of people's faces, but the most interesting part tends to be you know, here in the middle. And besides, we've already got our background, so I don't need to focus on the background. So for our third level, when we pick where to take triangles from, we're going to favor the middle of the image. So take them from the face here and then place them evenly all across the background image we have. I'm going to remove the background and show you just the third level isolated on its own here. Now let's put that onto our original background that we've built up. So here, here and here. The fourth layer, same again, but this time we're taking from the middle and then we're also putting back in the middle. So it's all going to be clumped vaguely around the middle. So I'll, again, I'll show you just the fourth layer with everything else removed and then everything back together again. That is the composition of all our levels. Now, the second thing is stylistic design. And this is very straightforward, um, keeping a relatively consistent style for all of these layers. These layers are, of course, created with Midjourney. Uh, the prompt I was using was roughly this here, 
which is to do with like cinematic, futuristic um, film, that type of thing. There's a couple of small variations to control the color palette. I'll drop in words like prismatic or vapor wave to try to control the colors. The outside was the same, but using phrases like American landscape and bright, sunny, colorful, that type of thing. Um, and those were both from the 60s. Meanwhile, I got the type of portrait I wanted from the 80s. I tried 60s. It wasn't quite right. 80s was perfect for the vibe that I was going for. So the prompt is over here. It's not that much different. I'm still using all the film camera type of stuff to try to keep the style within the same ballpark. There's a couple of reasons for doing this. There's the consistency I mentioned before. And then there's also the fact that there's no copyright on these images. They're AI generated, so I'm free to use them however they want. And in fact, anybody can take the images from this project and use them themselves. And I'm assuming that as long as they're not copying my code, whatever they decide to do with those images will look you know, significantly different to what I'm doing. And that's kind of neat. I like that idea. Anyway, so that's where the images are coming from. The third thing that I'm using is colour. Even though the source images have this shared stylistic look, I wanted to use colour to both add a unifying layer over a single image while also giving different pieces a more distinct look from each other. Most of the time they're using this sort of warm colour palette, but sometimes we go towards the stronger ends like the reds or the yellows or, or pulling in blues. So while like say something like this, this piece looks consistent, it's going to be very different from oh, this piece over here, different colors. So in the colors, I'm using two different processes. There's first a tint, and let me show you the output using just a tint. And then sometimes I'm using solid colors. So here's one that's just using the solid colors. In the project itself, I use a mixture of the two, although sometimes it favors more one way than the other way. And we'll see where it's doing that in the code in the coding section at the end. As a general rule, about 20% of the triangles are colored in. So if we take this one here, about 20% of those. We'll go into that more again in the code. And I think that's nearly everything. Oh, there's a couple more bits and bobs that I wanted to cover really quickly. The first is the selection of how many triangles are going to be used. So here you can see there's not that many rows compared to something like this where there's a lot of rows. And what I'm doing there is I found when I was doing lots of outputs in the whole range, I really like the ones on the lower end of the range and the upper end of the range. But the ones in the middle were kind of, you know, meh. And it also meant there wasn't an overall character for the project. It, it could be anything. But then by cutting out the middle, you had more of a distinction between like the high notes over here and then the, the low notes over here in the project. The other thing is that some of the time I'll switch the two background layers. So instead of it being like an indoor layer with some of the outdoor put on top of it, it'll be switched around so it's the outside layer with some of the inside put on top of it. Again, examples. That's to add uh, more variety. It's not obvious, but I mean, it's not supposed to be because it's in the background. But you have that um, that undertone that's, that's there that's slightly different. So those are kind of your base notes, if you like analogy type of thing. Also, sometimes we'll sort the background out completely, the, the very far one, and put a face in instead, which gives it a whole different vibe because you've got a face in the background and then more faces on top, more examples. There we have it. That's an overview of what's going on in the project and the decisions I made. Like I said, it doesn't need to be complicated. You can take a, like a simple, strong rule and then figure out how to apply it to all the stuff you have. The trick is, of course, to think about why you're doing what you're doing and trying to be intentional about those decisions. Do those decisions work together or do they work against each other? Do you have too many things going on at once? And if you do, how can you regain the balance about it? If you want to stick around for some code, and I'm not going to go too deep into that. I'm just going to pick out the bits that relate to the stuff that we've talked about and, and talk about them a little bit. If you want that, then stay here. If not, now's a good time to bail, which is great, fine, but hitting the like button on your way out would be super handy. And thank you for following along to this point. I will see you next time. For those sticking around, it's code time. And again, not too intense, just showing where things happen. So this snippet of code here is where we're talking about when we're picking the number of triangles to have. We're going to pick a number from zero to three 
and most of the time add 6 to it. But 25% of the time, we'll subtract that number from 18 instead. So that gives us like 6 to 9, or 18 down to 15. But none of this this middle stuff here instead. These next two bits of code are picking the index number for each layer to use, one for the inside, one for the outside, and then two different faces. I suppose they could be the same face. I don't think I'm checking that. The bit underneath is a 20% chance to swap the inside and the outside background around, and a 14% chance to use a face as the base image instead of the whichever one is now the background. We just chuck away the inside or the outside. We jump right down to the bottom of the code, and I'll link to the code later. There's a function that's being called on an interval timer that's triggered in the main index HTML page that loads them in, so it keeps going over this. And we don't want to load in all the images, that would be too many. We only want to load in the ones that we picked at the top of the code that we just looked at. This creates four image elements that are then told to load in the selected images, and each one has an onload event, which sets the fact that it's now loaded to true from false. The function keeps getting called until all four image loaded values are set to true, at which point I know I have them and I can kick off the rest of the code, which then draws all the stuff knowing that the images exist. Next up, we're going to figure out which triangles we're going to swap. So we loop through all the triangles, checking to see if we're going to swap something into that triangle. So if we are going to swap something into that triangle, we then randomly pick which triangle we're going to copy from to that point. Looping through all the triangles that way and then working out if we want to swap each one of them is a simplified way of doing things, which is good enough for the background. When it comes to the foreground, because of how we wanted to control the random placement of bits we were moving, we did something slightly different. I decided I wanted about 10% of the triangles to be pulled from the first face. That's, um, that's what's happening with the subset 1 value here. It's working out how many of the total triangles we're going to use. 10%. There's 100 triangles. We want to pull in about 10 of. The rather convoluted from index line uh, is used as a way to bias the selection from the middle area of the image where the face features are most likely to be. The easiest way of thinking about this, if you've not come across it before, you probably have, is like throwing two normal six-sided dice and the result um, is most likely to be seven because there are there are six ways to get that value. There's like one plus six, two plus five, three plus four, and then four plus three, and then so on. But there's only one way to score the number two, two ones, and one way to score 12, that's the two sixes. So if you roll those two dice together and then add them together, but then divide by 2, your lowest possible value of 2 moves down to 1, and your highest possible value of 12 goes down to 6. So just like a normal dice, from 1 to one to 6, but the most common value you get, which is 7, ends up at 3.5. So most of the time you're getting a value in the middle, and very rarely you're getting the ones at the edges. And it gives us this bell curve of probability where we're going to be stealing stuff from the middle these ones at the edge are far less likely. We're doing the same thing here. We're not picking a random number anywhere within the range of the, of the triangles per row, which will be spread evenly. We're doing it twice. We're randomly picking one number and then randomly picking again, add them together, divide them by two, and that will give us most likely picking stuff in the middle. The minus four and plus two that you're seeing there is just to avoid picking triangles along the edge, because if we pick a triangle that's half off, and then shove it over, we won't have all the image. So that's a bit of a special case just for this design. The final layer is very similar, but we're using that technique on both where we take the, the triangles from and then where we're going to stick the triangles to. So again, we're focusing on the middle, we're randomly picking stuff mainly from the middle, and we're putting it back into the middle. The last bit of decision making is all the palette stuff. You can see the code here. Very quickly, that's picking a random palette, which contains a number of colors in them. So features colorful has a 15% chance of being set. This is a bit of an odd way to do things, but allows me to set the human readable features on FX hash later. So the subset three mod is being used to control how many triangles should be colored in. 
by default that's 20% of the triangles. But if we're in colourful mode, if colourful is true, then that's 100% of the triangles. We're going to do all of them. The, the features tint versus fill is how likely the triangle is to either be filled in completely or just tinted. 50-50, um, 0 0.5 is the midpoint, but we can shift colours close towards um, tilting as we move nearer 0 0.333 or filled in as we move close to 0 0.666. That's all the decision making. All that's left is to draw the background image, throw all the triangles on it, which is fairly simple. It probably looks more complicated than it is. We're basically making a clipping mask where we want our triangle to be. And then we use the draw image to copy over a rectangle from the image we, we want to take from. And then we just stick it into the rectangle where you want it to be and then the clipping mask means that only the triangle area will be drawn. If it's flipped then we're using a transformation of the scale to flip the whole lot. We draw the triangle as we normally would and then it flips back which has effectively turned the triangle upside down. And that is pretty much, give or take a little bit, uh, how everything works. The project is on FX hash. It was open or it is open or it will be open for just 24 hours on the 28th of January or January 2023 and I've also posted the source code and I'll add both of those links below to the project and the source code should you wish to go and see more on that. I hope this was interesting. Um, I like to kind of explain it a little bit so that you understand a little bit more about the project. This was a, a fun one to do um, and I'm going to try to do a video like this for each project I do. I've got some catching up from all the old projects because I've done a bunch and I need to go back and do those. And I'm going to try to keep on top of the future ones. So if you want to see those, hit subscribe. Um, every subscription counts. It really helps. We need more generative art videos bubbling to the top of YouTube so people can discover this world of gen art and then, and then buy our art. That's that's one of the reasons to do it. Anyway, um, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.